Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you to everybody who is on Zoom joining us um, and who couldn't be here in person. Uh, we will be hanging out here until 7.30 p.m., but the interview will go to 7. I'm Shauna Lawson, the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving at UW-Tacoma. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you who actually came here in person and those on Zoom. This is our this is usually our virtual alumni speaker series, but we're bringing it back in person now and just giving an option for the hybrid event. How it will work in Zoom is that uh, if there's any technical difficulties, you can send a message in the chat and I will try to assist. Um, you can send the message directly to me. At the end of this interview, there will be a Q&A and we'll be taking uh, questions in the chat. I will get us started with the Share the Land Acknowledgement. So we recognize that all of us at UW Tacoma learn, live and work on and near the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people. In particular, we are situated on the traditional territory of the Puyallup. As people on this occupied territory, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial and all our indigenous connections today. We also have the responsibility to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. In light of this history, let us take active efforts to partner with our indigenous community members and neighbors as we continue our work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. I will now turn this over so we can start the interview. Um, I will turn this over. to Joe, Joe Hatz Colness. Yes. I hope I said that correctly. Close enough. So I will go ahead and let them start the interview. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Joe um, and our alumni speaker for tonight is gonna to be Steve Sturmer. Steve is a UWT 2016 Bachelor of Science, Computer Science graduate, currently working as a software engineer at Qualtrics one of the world's leading experience management companies where he currently leads initiatives around pipelining omnichannel data. Originally a student of audio engineering, Steve dropped out of college at the age of 20 and subsequent years as an executive chef, carving out a living in the grueling kitchen of the culinary industry. Making the choice to go back to school for his bachelor's degree, Steve started at UWT in 2014. While at UWT, Steve served as a teacher's assistant running the computer lab for offering tut tutoring for students. Steve credits his education at UWT as a driving force behind his ability to excel in the tech industry today. And uh, I have some questions for you, Steve. You cool, well, yeah. Well, uh, well, I guess thank you for the introduction and thank you for everyone being here um, and everyone on Zoom. So I appreciate the support and uh, yeah. All right. Well, first question is tell us about the work that you do. So I'm a software engineer at Qualtrics, which is an experience management company. Um, traditionally, like kind of the backbone product that we have is surveys. Um, our name is, you know, quality metrics. Um, and I guess kind of our other claim to fame is the, the owner owns the Utah Jazz. But yeah, that's the, what I'm currently doing. Very awesome. What made you transition from the career path of audio engineering and culinary arts to software engineering? Uh, so the, the, the transition I, I felt like was like rather organic. So when I was probably in high school, I realized that I could work on, on audio and not be bothered for like long periods of time, like eight hours. And so that was kind of the first um, pursuit in education. Um, but at the time, there was a major shift in, in that industry. So traditionally, audio was done, big studios with, you know, mixing boards, analog equipment. And at the time, the industry was transitioning to, um, you know, more of a digital state using home computers and things to record. But that also meant that it became a job that was once, you know, maybe like $70,000 a year to like a $12 an hour job. So by the time I graduated, a lot of the things I had learned were um, kind of irrelevant. Um, earlier on in high school, I was washing dishes. In college, I was washing dishes. Eventually I became promoted to a cook. So since things didn't really pan out with the audio thing, I just kind of stayed cooking. And eventually, you know, kind of made the best with what I had, rose to the level of a chef. Um, I, 
in the end, um, you know, at the at the peak point of being a chef, it was a it was a pretty terrible experience. I was working a lot of hours, so the transition away from that into a more professional job um, just kind of came about from that, like leagues of, of frustration. So. so, with your transition and those skills, what do you do in your current role as a software engineer? So, I do a lot of different things that I used to do. Like, uh, you know, when I was younger, I did a lot of uh, just kind of pure coding, but now I've got about six and a half years of experience. So I do a lot of, um, I'll get like theoretical tasks or real ambiguous tasks. And I'm kind of designing the, you know, the software infrastructure behind them. Specifically, you know, Qualtrics does, um, you know, surveys as kind of the backbone, but there's other sources of data that they collect through social media, uh, user clicks, voice data, and things like that. So my team specifically works on pipelining like voice data and voice related data both into Qualtrics and out of Qualtrics. Awesome. And why did you choose UW Tacoma? So when I started with like computer science, like UW has like eighth in the nation for computer science. Um, I was in my late 20s, so I knew I didn't want to live in like a dorm. Um, and so I, I started looking at the feasibility of where I could live not in a dorm. Um, Seattle was like, I don't know, Bothell was out. Um, but the housing in Tacoma was reasonably affordable. So I came here. Right, awesome. What do you think was your most significant experience here at University of Washington Tacoma? So I have a, probably a, a couple like moments in time that I think of. Um, one of them was in a very early class, um, like, like I think it's like CS171, which is kind of the root um, computer science program. But we, I think it was our first test or our first homework assignment or something, but the kids around me, were discussing that they had looked around in Canvas um, and found the either the the answer to the homework or the test key, and they were like, you know, talking amongst each other, you know, it's wanted or whatever. And I kind of I had this moment, and I, I'm not like uh, you know I don't know a cheater by nature or something like that, but I did think about it, and then I was like, wait a minute, I can't do that. You know, if I shortchange myself on things like that, when I get into the industry, I'm going to be eaten alive. And so I kind of made this conscious decision of like, I got to do, you know, what's best through, for me throughout the course of my education. And, you know, I kind of stuck with that. Um, and it, it worked out for me. I think some of the people that were in that ended up flunking out of the program. So um, and another significant kind of moment in time that I remember is there was a teacher at the time um, who was real. Her, her concepts were really abstract. And um, there was a lot of students complaining that she was kind of inactive and things like that. And um, there was a professor uh, at the time, Dr. Mobis, who came in and talked to us. And he said, you know, he was kind of addressing us. He says, you know, well, a large part of computer science is kind of learning things on your own. Um, and uh, at the time, it just kind of sounded like a, a weird excuse, but I did take it to heart. Um, and he was right, like, you know, studying on your own is, is really a huge part of computer science. So that was something that stuck out to me. Well, yeah, that, that foundation is very important to have um, when developing your study habits for sure. Yeah. Um, other than this Dr. Bobis, Bobis? Bobis, Bobis yeah. uh, is there anyone else, any mentor or students that, um, that in your life that added to your experience here? Yeah, like uh, Dr. Mobus, I think I've had probably two or three classes with him, but he was pretty memorable. I think he's still around here in some capacity. Another one was like uh, Brian Goda. I had a couple of different classes with him. I think if you have a class with Brian Goda, you'll remember Brian Goda. Um, America Abraham, I had, I went to summer school and she was like one of the professors that was here on campus during the summer. So I had her for like two classes, both like databases and Android development. So I always liked uh, to talk to her because she was one of the few professors that had like actual industry experience. Um, so to hear her perspective was kind of um, refreshing. And then uh, Raghavi Sakpal. So I was her teaching assistant. So I, when I was, you know, graduating and, and sort of applying for jobs, she helped me reviewed my resume and kind of walked me through some different technical concepts I had questions about. So. Awesome. So with, how did you translate your skills that you got from UW Tacoma to apply into the skills that you use in your career? Well, computer science is like one of these rare degrees that's really like a kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. Like it's like nursing or something. Like if you get a degree in nursing, usually you end up as a nurse. Um, so 
with with a computer science degree, it's really the same kind of thing. You end up usually in a software development role. So for me to translate that, it, it was it was pretty easy. I, you know, I know that there's a lot of other degrees, like if you have like a marketing degree or like a philosophy degree or something like that. That that transition is probably a little bit harder, but I found it um, pretty easy. Yeah. So with those classes that are offered differently, um, if you could go back and do it over again, would you take the same classes? Would you join different clubs? Um, how would you do it again? I think the biggest thing that I would do is the internship. I never did an internship. Um, I was kind of, I had, I, I never talked to any other you know, professional level developers when I was in college. And one of the big things that I had in mind was that an intern was like the cliche person who like gets coffee and like takes notes. And it's just like a rite of passage to get a job. But that's not really true within the computer science industry. There's like some some legal rules about using um, an intern's product within like a, like a production environment. So usually computer science interns are paid. And I never knew that. Um, and so for me, I was always trying to figure out how to balance like, you know, working with like an unpaid internship and, um, you know, potentially not collecting like financial aid or something like that. So I ended up, you know, skipping it. And that was probably a, a fairly deep regret um, that I have. <laughs> All right. And for your experiences at UW Tacoma, how did that kind of influence your pursuits as a career? And what are your... Um, career goals still today? Um, well, so for my pursuits, obviously, um, well, after UW, I've never had a non-professional level job. It's only been software engineering roles for the past six and a half years. So that's been a, a you know, obviously a huge shift going from like the service industry to like a professional job. Um, as far as where I want to go, um, you know, I have various different aspirations. I'd maybe like to be a CTO or something of like a, a startup maybe in you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, I'm always trying to, to grow and see how far I can push the bar. So that's, that's usually just kind of the fun of, of working for me is, is how far you can push yourself. And as your role as a software engineer, what surprised you the most about your area of work? Uh, so it, it's kind of a weird answer, but um, kind of having to navigate the differences between like social and economic in groups of people. And like to expand on that. So I always had these blue collar jobs, kind of high, high labor, low buck kind of jobs. And the progression to like a professional level job was very natural. It was, I was, I hated the job. How do I have a more sustainable future? And so, you know, I want this job. I need to get educated for it. So that, that progression was just natural. Um, and I assumed that most people had experience that in some way or another, um, either themselves or watching their parents. But when I joined like the professional level workforce, it was weird to meet some people that had only had professional level jobs. There was no summer at McDonald's or something like that. It was just pure. My first job was making 100K at Amazon. My parents, you know, first job was, you know, and it was weird to have to kind of navigate the differences between our backgrounds. It was something that I didn't expect would exist, um, but it does. We yeah, have um, definitely people with different backgrounds can contribute differently in better um, scenarios. Um, also, what would you say students are nervous about not working specifically in their field of study? I think statistically, um, it's probably pretty common. Um, so I guess somebody could take comfort in the fact that knowing they're probably not alone. Um, if somebody is in that predicament because they're having trouble finding a job, I would say to maybe stay persistent, you know, coming out of college and getting my first job, I think I'd probably apply to a hundred different places. And my experience isn't unique. I communicate with a lot of other developers and that's just kind of the nature of the business. So if somebody is in that situation because they're having trouble landing a job, I would say stay persistent. Um, if somebody else was in that position because they had maybe more of a, a broad degree, if they have a degree in like, you know, um, sociology or history or marketing or something like that. I will say that if you work and, and try to be creative, you can use those skills um, in lots of different places. An example of that is like, you know, when I was a chef, I learned how to you know, build camaraderie between people. I learned how to manage teams. I learned how to have like an active voice. I learned how to, 
be in an intimidating situation and, and being like, hey, we don't do that here. And, and to sort of have that um, bravado. And that was something that was able to translate to computer science. So I think if you're, you're creative, you can figure out how to parlay those skills um, into something else. Diversity in groups. Um, other than the experience of, or the uh, challenge of kind of getting to another field of work that isn't your degree of study, were there any personal or professional challenges that um, were significant for you and how did you push through those? Um, I mean, as I kind of mentioned, like the state of the tech industry is, is, is brutal. There's a there's a pretty large demand for developers, but there's a really high demand for good developers. And the hiring process is terrible. Like it, it's not it's not sitting down with somebody and asking them questions. It's given these weird technical problems that you're, and it's all about like how you problem solve. It's got nothing to do with the day-to-day -day work that a developer does. But having to study to pass an interview was like a huge weird, Thing that I had to to overcome in order to, to land, um, you know, a lot of my jobs. And um, since you came back to school, you got your degree, started work. How has the education impacted you and your family? I mean, it's impacted us immensely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm able to, you know, I first off, I, I guess I work regular hours. I have like weekends off, which was a you know really nice change of pace from everything I had done before that. Um, Financially, I'm in a much better position. I have, you know, a reliable car. I was able to become a homeowner. Um, I was able to expand my family. Um, I went on to have other children because I felt like I was in a, a fiscally responsible place. Um, so yeah, it's had a, a huge effect on me. Well, that's awesome. Great here. And um, while getting your education and going through all the kind of work and studies, what did you do to protect your mental health? I did have a job um, in college, so I worked at like a nightclub. Um, so even though that wasn't the most fun thing, like the just the break in duties, I guess, um, sort of helped. And then I had a lot of side projects, like one of them throughout college, I was like designing a video game. Um, and so I, I made sure to take time to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I just had a lot of other side pursuits that I, I made room for. Awesome. I have one last question for me. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give any current students? Just to stay curious or continue curiosity. Um, I think something that's always helped me is kind of the wanting to peel the layers of the onion, like to really understand um, an issue. Like it's not enough to solve the problem, but to figure out, you know, why the solution work. And like in, in computer science, that's especially a big thing. Like if you fix a software bug, it's, it's one thing to go, okay, it's fixed, get out of our lives. It's another to go, why did it break? And to really go, oh, I see, okay. And to, to really understand and to master that. But yeah, that's the best piece of advice I can tell people is just to stay curious and, and continually investigate and try to, you know, dig to the bottom. So. Yeah. 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 No, so at this time, we can go ahead and transition to Q&A, and if anyone here has questions, um, I do have a couple of questions in the chat, but you can go ahead and open up for Q&A here, and then I'll scroll through the questions. Awesome. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? Yes. So, Steve, is, um, someone you indicated that you were older when you can't, you weren't, you know, out of high school, like your traditional college student. Um, how did how did you fit with those younger people? How, you said that they were going to go and cheat. Um, how did you work with them and how did that? My experience, at least like at UW Tacoma, is I wasn't alone with like older students. Like I felt like it was pretty commonplace here. Joining the workforce was a little bit um, challenging. Admittedly, a lot of my colleagues are much younger than me. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I've always considered myself kind of a youthful guy. So I, I've been able to fit in that way. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely is um, challenging. But I, I guess sometimes, too, I try to use it to my advantage. Sometimes if you're an older, you can kind of come off in a position of authority. So there's been I've been able to, you know, if I'm older, sometimes use that to my advantage via being 
uh, and presenting myself as an authority figure. That you were able to connect with the other people and, and you know, I mean, computer science, yeah, yeah it's, you're kind of on your own, but you still have to work in teams or whatever. You sure, still yeah. Um, you know, I, I would try to find a common thread and there's, there's, there's lots of them. Like, you know, I, even though I was older, like I still played video games and so did a lot of them. And so that was always something we were able to, to come together on, or um, even, even just general things like, man, that homework's terrible. And I thought it was terrible too. Like, you know, you, you find a common thread that you can, can bond to people on. Anyone else have any questions? I do have one in the chat here. And Minica is here. She's online. Hey, all right. She's here. Let's see. What sustained your motivation over the years? That is coming from Adirazak. Um, I guess for me, like at least for you know, UW Tacoma and the tech thing, I had a really terrible time when I was uh, a chef. At the end of being a chef, I was working 70 hours a week. Um, I, would, I, would, I would get up about 8.30 in the morning. I would leave my house about nine. I would drive about an hour. I would work from 10 to 10 and I would drive home. Um, and I would do that six or seven days a week. And I was absolutely miserable. Um, and so for me, what has drove me is I don't want to go back to that. And I've never forgotten how horrible things were. And, and um, you know, it's, I, I think about where I am now too. Like, you know, I probably make five, six times the amount of money I did as a chef and I work half the hours. Like I, I, I'm always thinking about my past and I'm using that to drive me forward. Yes. So I actually do have two questions, but I'll ask one of Steve and then one's a admin type question. But, um, so, and my husband points out um, that you didn't mention when you were doing your, you know, job search that you didn't mention, you know, like network connections where, you know, through LinkedIn or, yeah. you know, where it used to be, you used to hit the street and you, you know, called on your buddies and stuff like that. Yeah. Did you have, did you use that? As um, a little bit, but not, not overly. I, I wish that I had like, you know, spent more time with my fellow students because there was a lot of networking going on and, and, um, and in, in the tech industry, that's a big, that's a big thing is, is like, you know, you, you go to a college and you network with people and you, a lot of people get jobs that way. Um, but yeah, I, for me, I really didn't, um, I have, I have, you know, some friends that I made here that I, I networked with and, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was limited, more limited than I would have wanted. So my admin question was, um, so of course, coming off a pandemic and so forth and remote learning, um, what, what does it look like for the classes in the near future? Are they going to be, you know, are there going to be more in person, which personally I think is very important um, rather than just doing, you know, uh, hybrid or online type of thing do you do you know what that's going to look like well um a lot of the students are back they've been back so over 60 percent of the students have been back and so yes we are back on campus <laughs> so it's going to look in person um of course there's always been some classes that were online um but yeah, we, we are in-person campus, so that's what it's looking like. Um, and the students are around. It's just, I guess, um, school starts at the end of September. <laughs> so that's when everything will get to, to buzzing around here. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. And hopefully we're going in the right direction with, the, you know, that we won't be shut down. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's a fine line to balance to have, you know, meet people's needs. I mean, there be people who have daytime jobs, but they want to get a career. So you have to offer online or nighttime or whatever. So. Yeah. Or weekend. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that question. No, while registering, they uh, they offer very numerous online and in person. So luckily, I was able to get all in person. And for summer, I even like messaged. Uh, 
the admissions and was like, is there going to be another in-person option for class? And they are always working towards working on that. So always flexible. I have another question. I uh, just thought of it while you were talking about um, your hours of work. Yeah. How important would you say is to like work time and like personal time to like balancing those time? Like, do you, uh, you have any advice on, on that? Um, Happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be it can be challenging before Qualtrics I actually worked for like a consulting company though and when I worked for the consulting company we're obviously billing the work we do to somebody else and we weren't allowed to work over 40 hours so I, I got this attitude very much of you know it's four o'clock and I close my laptop and I'm 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 gone and it was you know it was like a you know I don't know like a bureau, bureaucratic thing like I, I couldn't work they told me not to and so I wouldn't um, but that, that mentality has stuck with me. I still do that. Like, um, some of my colleagues used to make fun of me because it'd be like three 30 and I have a train to catch and I would close it and I was out. Like I didn't, I, and I, I always, I still make that, that effort to, you know, there's a, a few rare times where I'm like trying to close a project, but for the most time, like at the end of the day, that's it. And I'm done and I'm out. I'm off doing something else. Do they ever ask you to stay over time? They don't, they don't ever ask. Um, some companies have on call, including mine. Um, so occasionally you just kind of have to bite the bullet and have a, you know, a, a bad week or whatever, where you can be woken up or whatever. Um, that's just kind of the nature of the business. I feel like, um, you know, I feel like I'm compensated for that. Like I, I'm not, I'm not angry that, you know, like this is my job or I don't get paid enough for this. Like I, you know, I feel like it's, at some point, you know, there's something they could give to you to you to be willing to be like, okay, I'll answer a call in the middle of the night. And I, I feel like that's being met. So. Perfect. Yeah. so there's another question in the chat that says, can you talk more about your roles in Radiant Vision Systems and Slalom Build? Sure. Um, <coughs> we had an in-person one. Do we want that one first or the... Okay. Um, yeah, so my... my role at Radiant Vision Systems was like a very um, kind of low level. It was my very first job. Um, a lot of it was just kind of learning refactoring and code and kind of being like a professional developer. I thought the company itself, I'm not the, I don't know, the, the work history there was was maybe a little bit rough. Some of the, the practices were, I don't know, maybe a little dated. Um, but I learned a lot about, you know, how to structure code and kind of um, architect it in an eloquent way. Um, and then at Slalom, a lot of it was sort of learning how to be a leader um, within the tech industry. Like I, I had been a leader as a chef, but this was my first chance to kind of do that within the tech industry. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I worked on pretty much the same project for like a couple of years, but I was able to take it from nothing and raise it all the way to the point of development and, you know, be the technical lead and the person who's answering you know questions for the customer and um, so yeah we had a question about uh you know i know coming out of school it's a you know highly skilled degree and you said it's a it's a fairly uh easy transfer into the professional environment in terms of being able to step in and, and be able to have applicable skills but i was wondering and through the progression of your career so far have you been able to walk into the places you've worked and say, hey, this is what I know, and also at the same time be like, this is what I don't know? And has there been people there to kind of lift you up and carry you so you can ask those questions and build on the skills as you go, besides just figuring a lot of it out on your own? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I, I, think, I think regardless of how much you know, anytime you go into like a tech company, you're going to be, there's, there's proprietary software, there's so many different languages. And so there's, it, there's an, an understanding and I learned this like early on is, is people say that like the first nine months that you're working at a tech company, you're worthless. Like you're not doing anything. And I've really kind of found that to be true. And I expect that when new hires come on too, it's like, I'll give you these baby projects and I'll, I'll teach you, you know, whatever we need to know, but there's an acclimation period that I think everyone within the tech industry um, expects, you know, like again back to cooking like you know to get acclimated and to be cooking a meal i think you could start with no experience and by the end of the shift be doing it you can't do that with computer science you can't start and so i think i think 
almost every company understands that and they're willing to work and, and you know, teach you those things. Um, Abdizarak says, how is the game currently going? So the game was released. Um, so it was, it was like an add-on for uh, Fallout. <laughs> so I worked really hard on that um, and I released it like ahead of Fallout 4. Um, and I intentionally um, did that to try to gain like uh, press coverage and I was successful. So it was like on the, you know, like the front page of Reddit when it came out. Um, I was interviewed by like Rockstar Games and stuff like that. Um, it, it didn't lead to like a fruitful career within the gaming industry, but it did lead to a lot of uh, potential opportunities. So. There's another question from Minica. Um, what are some challenges that you faced at work when you first started? Um, I guess for me, so I felt like the, the, the program at UWT was very um, fundamentally focused. A lot of it was, was learning some of these, these low level things on, on how computers function fundamentally. Um, one thing that we didn't hammer on was like a lot of new age, you know, like web development technologies and things like that. So that was something that, you know, I, I, I had to, to kind of learn and um, learn quickly when I, when I first gained the industry or joined the industry. Any other questions? Yeah, any other questions of the audience? Sir? Well, I do have one. Oh, and then can you say your name? <laughs> your first name? I can. Okay. <laughs> Make up a fake one if you'd like. You want me to say it? <laughs> ask, ask names. John. John. Um, so, Steve, it, it sounds like the, um, the move from you know, working in the in the restaurant hospitality industry to coming back to UW Tacoma was a strategic move. Um, and that's the way that I think about education, actually having worked a little bit in the newspaper industry and then went to the UW Seattle mm -hmm. um, to get an undergrad and grad degree. Um, so what is your next strategic move? Uh, do you see coming back to uh, UW again, or do you see some other uh, move to further your career? I, I've thought about coming back to UW, but for me, I think it's just going to be how far can I push myself in a, in a professional sense? Like I would like to be, I don't know. I have, I, I guess for me, sometimes I have aspirations of being such a high level engineer that nobody really knows what I do and mm -hmm. everything's kind of abstract. And I'm, I'm really allowed a lot of like creative freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really cool goal. I know that there's such people exist Mm -hmm. um, you know, they exist within the Qualtrics or Google and things like that. Um, but yeah, I have, I just have aspirations to kind of see how far I can push the envelope in a professional way. So, so in large companies, you know, like a warehouse or a Boeing, they would call that a technical fellow. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I don't remember Qualtrics name for it, but yeah, I think, uh, I think Google has a distinguished fellow or something like that. Is they, you know, their various degrees. And yeah. When I was a warehouser, there were like seven in the in the company right. out of twenty five thousand or something. Some wizard somewhere is just sitting in a room. But yeah, I think that'd be a, a cool opportunity to have. All right, Abdurazak says, "Congrats on the game," and he says he's going to apply at Qualtrics. Could you please clarify the entire application process? Could you also describe what you do on a daily basis at your job? Sure. Um, so I guess the, the process for Qualtrics isn't <laughs> unique between any kind of tech company. You apply, somebody reviews your resume or they have some kind of software that reviews it. Um, you usually end up with a call to a recruiter. Um, and that's usually just to kind of vet you as a person a little bit and to make sure that you're not, um, I don't know, giving kind of wildly inappropriate responses to questions. Um, from that, you usually go on to some kind of tech screen. And they're usually the types of problems that they ask on like leakcode.com or hackerrank.com. They're usually these, these weird problem solvings like, um, you know, given an unsorted list, find uh, the median number passing through the, you know, the list only one time. 
you know, stuff like that where you, you have to kind of, you know, solve that in front of them and they'll examine, you know, your, your capabilities, I guess, through there. Technical yeah, a technical interview. Um, and then from there, I think at least at Qualtrics, we've kind of changed it to, um, you'll have like a personal qualities interview and then you'll come back and do a few more technical interviews. But the, the idea of like technical interviews and these like personal quality interviews are like a big kind of on-site. Um, I would say that's fairly standard within the, the tech industry. Um, and what was the second portion? Day My day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I take a lot of meetings. Uh, it depends on the day. Um, some days I would say it's like 60, 70% meetings. Um, but I, a lot of times I will kind of design um, a project up front. Like Qualtrics does something that is called like a, a waterfall style development. And what that is, is it's really like a front loaded um, style of development where I'm, I'm on the hook to write this big fat um, specification document up front. Some companies do something that's, you know, called like agile development, which is much more spontaneous, but I'll write one of these um, and then I'll kind of carve out the, the different work that is required to do it. Um, and then I'll either, you know, have somebody else do kind of these individual tasks assigned to it or I'll do it. So like right now I'm in the middle of um, one of these things. Well, I'm actually toward the end of it, like wrapping it up. So pretty much I'll, I'll start my day. Um, I'll check my emails. I will kind of open up my ID and I'll start, you know, doing some coding. I'll go to my stand-up meeting where I report my status. Um, sometimes there's various other meetings where we're talking about other things. Um, so those occur throughout the day. Um, I'll have one-on-ones with different teams or like different people. Um, we'll talk with different teams, but usually it, it's, it's just a lot of going back and forth between meetings and code or meetings and designing various different documents. And while you're doing those meetings, I know they can get pretty uh, insane during, especially midweek. Um, would you say that you kind of need to dedicate certain days to coding because you're so sparse in meetings, or do you ever just like get locked in, and, like, get interrupted by meetings, or yeah, all the time? Yeah, um, I, I think that's just a. I think it's a. It's a pretty overwhelming, common problem. Um, I've seen a lot of people block out on their calendar like four hours in the afternoon. Focus time, don't bother me. And they'll deny all meetings through there. Um, I'm okay with the context switching. Like I, I have some days that I just know are, are going to be super heavy in meetings. And I, I maybe don't anticipate getting super deep into any kind of coding or, or getting, you know, some significant task wrapped up. But then I have other days where I'm like, oh yeah, like from 11, 11 a.m. to four, I'm free. And so those are the times that I'll really you know, dive in. Awesome. Any other questions in the audience? I have a question for you. So you're back at UW Tacoma right now. What made you come back here? So I think I, I kind of mentioned that I never really had an opportunity to like poke at a software developer and ask them questions. Um, and I always wanted like, the internship thing, I never, I, like I said, I always thought it was the cliche, like you're grabbing coffee for people. And um, I never knew what an internship, like within the computer science. It's, I wanted to give that opportunity back. And then I also remember that when I was here, we did have somebody come in and speak from, from Google, an alumni. Um, and so it was really interesting to hear, you know, an actual perspective from somebody who worked in the industry. So I guess I was hoping that I could be that to at least some people out there. Well, you are. Right. And um, I had another follow-up to that. Minica says, Steve, I really appreciate you doing this and giving back because that's what it's all about. Um, are you aware of Huskies at Work, the mentoring program? I am not. Okay, so that's coming on Tacoma Husky Landing and Husky Landing, I should say. Um, which is our networking platform. Okay. I'll be sharing a little bit about that at the end of the day, but um, I'm glad that you're back. You graduated in what year again? Uh, 2016. That makes you a grad of the last decade. Yeah. So you're like a recent grad and it's amazing to see. You said that your salary was six times 
something like that. Yeah. More than what you were making before. I think that's amazing. And it does take some strategy to get there. So when you're going into those interviews, when you were going into the interviews, how did you set your salary to, like, did you say, I'm going to set it much higher at this level? How did you decide how to negotiate that salary and how did you negotiate that? Um, so it was, it was challenging. Like my, my first job, it was kind of, I'll take whatever you offer me. Um, just because I felt like I wasn't in a, I didn't have an internship experience. I didn't have, I didn't have, I didn't have the balance, the, the, you know, the, it wasn't, the scales weren't swinging in my favor. Um, but after a while, I just, you know, I, I frequently post on different job boards, not job boards, but like, uh, groups with other developers where we discuss, you know, jobs and things like that. And I, I check a lot of different sites, um, Glassdoor and like blind and like, uh, levels FYI. So like, I'm familiar with what other people make. Um, and so that was the other thing too, is I always kind of set my aspirations to that. And I made it clear to my managers, Hey, I want to make this amount. Like what, what can we do to get there? Um, and there was sometimes where if I felt like I wasn't getting that, I would leave for a company that was willing to pay me that. So I, I, I just kind of followed closely. And I don't think that to me, when I look at a company like um, like Google or something like that, I I don't think they're doing something so magical there that you know they should be making you know three times of, of what I was making at another place. And so I, I kind of kept that mentality, and and so I always made sure that I you know worked toward a salary that I thought was um, you know acceptable and and what I deserved. So. Thank you. I have a question about that. Um, if you're in a role and you've been working on it for, say, a project to it's kind of developing those relationships within your company, and there is a higher position within that company, um, what is there a time period or is there a comfort level that made you want to even consider going to the next level or the next position that offered you more? And how did you approach that? I mean, I'm always just trying to to grow. So, like, I usually it's never been like um, a situation where like, you know, Hey, we have this single role, you know, would you like to, to try out for it? I've worked for companies that just have kind of, um, you know, I don't know, a large number of, of people on the level above. And so it's just like, I want to get to the next level. What do I need to do to get there? And I, I usually sit down and I have conversations with my managers like, okay, what, what, what am I, what am I not doing that I need to, to start doing? Like, let's, let's get this going. Um, and yeah, if I, if I'm at a company that I feel like I'm not getting that, um, you know, I have left. Like I, at Radiant, I felt like there wasn't the opportunity for growth. Um, and so that was part of the reason why I left. I went to a bigger company that did, and they, you know, they were, they were willing to promote, they were willing to, to train, they were willing to really foster growth. And I, you know, I stayed with them for, you know, over three years. Yeah, communication, very important these days. <laughs> Abdurazak has a question. How did you distinguish yourself from the competition to land all these incredible jobs? Uh, it was, I guess for me, I have, I'll, I'll share my, my, my secret. So uh, a lot of it is like, uh, like resume writing, like getting my foot into the door. And then, you know, from there it's, it's having to rely on like studying, you know, these interview skills. But um, when I submit a resume, if I'm not getting feedback on that, if companies aren't going like, hey, you know, we saw your resume, we'd like to talk to you, then I'll trash it and I'll continue to write another one. The other thing that I do, and this is like my special sauce for everyone watching, is I will look at several different job descriptions of jobs that I'm interested for. And they might be like, you know, we're looking for somebody who does microservices, distributed systems, JavaScript, TypeScript. And I kind of put all that data in front of me and then I kind of aggregate that into my resume of, you know, the things that I did do that they were asking for. And so from that and using that technique, I mean, I've had, I've had interviews at, at probably most major tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you know, I, I know Qualtrics is a small name, but in the, in the tech world, you know, they're, they're a company that is, is, you know, pretty well respected, but yeah, I, I've been able to land interviews with with most companies that I've wanted to. So. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, how much uh, did you embellish your skill set 
during those interviews? Um, yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't say I embellish. Like, I would say that I, I try to be um, real eloquently, like, real eloquent with the way you describe. Like, I'll say, you know, authored code in, you know, such a way. Like, I do try to phrase it in a, in a, in a, in a nice manner. But I wouldn't say that, like, I, I overly embellish. I guess maybe I have a follow-up then. Um, uh, coming through the uh, service industry myself, um, I've noticed that you can make jumps, I guess, when it comes to uh, what company you work for, what restaurant you work for. Yeah. And that involves my previous question. So I guess I suppose you answered it, but um, yeah. Take and then what's your name? Carter. Carter. Are you you wondering about like like jumps from company to company? Jumps from company to company and uh, ways to translate your previous skill set in an advantage, a strategic way. Um, so a lot of times, like to translate it, I'll use or I'll, I'll mention like the core skills. So like maybe if I'm doing something super specific at a company, like maybe I'm not necessarily mentioning that, but maybe the backbone is I'm using TypeScript or something like that. Like that's what they want to know, and so that's what I'll I'll put on there. Like. Um, and then as far as, I guess, jumps to company and jumps in position, that's probably realistically the best way to raise your salary. When I've, when I've gone from, you know, I, I've gone from leaps of, it, it's usually over 20,000, um, you know, like on an annual base pay when I go from these jobs, sometimes much more. But yeah, that's the fastest way to excel is to be a person who's willing to, to walk away if you're not getting what you want. How did that affect the stability with your family? Um, it hasn't been too bad. Like, I mean, I, I've, I like, I've always picked roles within the like Seattle area, and like, um, the role from like going from slalom to Qualtrics, I intentionally picked Qualtrics because they were near the rail line. I <laughs> mean, um, it, it's a it's a weird way to pick, and I know a lot of other people are you know they they come to it for another reason, but. Um, you know, I picked it because it was the same. It was literally, I still got to take the sounder at the same time every day and, and nothing changed for my family, so. I have two questions in the chat. Uh, Abdu, Abdurizak, he is really firing these questions off. Um, have you ever been in a predicament where you couldn't get out of your own brain? If so, how did you emerge from that slump? Oh, man. Um, I... <laughs> I do like yeah, my wife hates it. Sometimes I, I will like I'll obsess over a problem. Um, and, and like I, I can't focus on anything else. And like she hates it because she'll like, you know, want me to uh, pay attention to her or something like that. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm too focused on this. I, um, but usually I, it's the same kind of thing where I was talking about earlier, where I have this this tendency to really try to dig to the bottom. Um, so when I am faced with these problems, I'll, you know, I'll really try to, to you know, hammer on a solution. That makes sense. Veneca says, "What advice do you have for students while they are here in the program?" Um, I guess just kind of take it seriously um, and continue to, um, I guess you know, do your best. Don't don't sell yourself short. Like I, I kind of mentioned, like the cheating thing, and I realized that, like I would be eaten alive. That's one hundred percent true. So I think just um, I don't know. Always you know, continually try to make the effort. Oh, I guess the other thing too is. When I came here, I really was committed to making my education work. And sometimes there's these, you know, like you'll have somebody who's offering help after school or something like that. And you're like, I don't want to go to that. That seems lame or whatever. But I was so committed to my education that I was like, I'm going to go to this weird study group in the library with these couple other kids. I need help. I will I will make that work. And I, I did. Like I, I would take all these different opportunities that were here because I was committed to making this work. I didn't want to go back to cooking. So I guess that's uh, another piece of advice is just take, try to take, take advantage of all the opportunities that you can. All right, we have time for one more question. If there's any questions, now is the time. You've answered a lot. So with that, um, we will go ahead and wrap up. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Thank you to everyone on Zoom. I will put a link in the chat about Tacoma Husky Landing. Um,
and then I'll share it here with everybody. We'll have refreshments and snacks at the end here. If you are nearby, you can you can come see us for about 15 to 30 minutes if you want to. We'll be here. But if not, we will see you at the next um, alumni speaker series, which is in October during Welcome Days. It is on October 13th, and our speaker is Nadia Caldwell. She is an alum. And so uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Um, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Steve. Um, so I will just say, everybody stay safe out there and go dogs. Uh, keep yourselves safe, and we'll see you soon.